We're happy to have uh, Dr. Carl Heinz Kampert, Professor Dr. Carl Heinz Kampert, uh, to give us this talk about, well, most powerful title, most energetic particle in nature or let's say the whole universe. Professor Kampert uh, did his uh, PhD at the Universität Münster um, in 1986, but uh, he spent several years uh, studying at Berkeley uh, on nuclear physics with, you know, the last days of the federal act I learned. Really amazing. So after, after his uh, PhD, he took a fellowship to CERN for three years, and then in 89, he returned to Minister as, uh, as an assistant professor, and uh, he, uh, he filed his publication uh, at uh, Minister in 1993, and uh, in 95, he took a professorship at Kaltua. Um, and while there, I think he migrated from nuclear physics to cosmic ray physics. And in 99, he became the spokesperson of uh, uh, this experiment called Cascade Grande. And in 2003, he picked up the chair at his current location at the University of Wuppertal. Now, um, Kalmeins, if I may call you that way, uh, has illustrious career. I think it's a little bit too long to introduce everything. I just in, uh, you know, introduce the most, most important one. Since 2011, <coughs> as you see roughly on uh, this image here, he's been a spokesperson of the biggest experiment on Earth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, uh, and I think, I don't know. <laughs> Would I be the richest if that was true? But, uh, this Auger experiment uh, located in South America in Argentina. Um, since 2004, he's been a, a member of the C4 Commission. I notably, I notably noticed that in Taiwan we do not have real C4, I mean, just uh, cosmic ray physics and so on. So maybe that's why we have him here. Um, and since end of last year. He was elected to the chair of C4. And otherwise, um, uh, he was elected to uh, the, the Academia Europa uh, since two, year, two and a half years ago. So I, I, I don't remember. I can't remember whether I did anything. Else. Anyway, I think uh, it's uh, the biggest title possible. So, <laughs> Heinz, uh, the energy is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. So it's a, uh, can you hear me? Yes. So it's, it's a great pleasure and honor uh, to, to be here for this colloquium and uh, I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, and uh, yeah, as already said in the introduction, um, uh, this, what, what I will talk about is kind of illustrated already here uh, in this artistic uh, view. Uh, so what are the most energetic particles in nature? You will see these are cosmic ray particles. Uh, and the figure illustrates also how we do measure these particles. Uh, and, and what happens is that if these particles enter the atmosphere, uh, they shower up in, in, in billions of secondary particles, and these secondary particles are then measured with an array of particle uh, detectors on the Earth's surface, uh, and they are distributed here uh, in the case of the OZ Observatory to 3,000 uh, square kilometer, and this in fact makes, makes it the largest uh, experiment uh, on Earth, I mean, in, in area. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can discuss in, 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 in uh, material or in volume and so on, but this surely is the, the largest uh, in area. Uh, and, and then, yeah, well, I, I could continue on this. So this is um, what the purpose is. And so let me introduce to you, because I understand cosmic ray physics uh, is uh, most familiar to you, um, what what we are going to measure. And uh, what you see here is a double logarithmic plot of the cosmic ray energy spectrum. I'm sorry for the bad visibility here. So here you see data points uh, further down here. So this is uh, uh, an impressive um, a collection of data. It covers, if you look here, 32 orders of magnitude in flux. Uh, and this makes it actually, uh, it's another extreme. Uh, the, um, the most dynamic observable ever measured in any experiment. 
uh, and if you compare the dynamic range to something you think you understand, uh, it compares to the diameter of the human hair to the size of the visible universe, which is just in one observable named the flux of cosmic rays. And uh, what you find, however, is that the flux here is very, uh, say, unspectacular. I mean, it's, it's a more or less a, a, a one single slope here, which you find in the spectrum in the double logarithmic plot. Uh, since it's a slope here, in the double logarithmic plot, it tells you that the uh, energy distribution is described by our power law uh, spectrum and uh, not, so for example, by an exponential spe spectrum. And uh, the fact that it's a power law tells you already something about the nature of the, of the creation of these particles. So it's not of thermal origin because in case of thermal origin, you would not expect a power law distribution. So it's something else. And uh, this something else is um, we understand nowadays from exploration of particles in shock fronts, so this is understood. As it tells already, this is a non thermal origin of the particle. And uh, so this is uh, very impressive, and uh, it's clear that you cannot measure such an observable over 32 orders of magnitude with <coughs> just one experiment. So, in fact, this is a collection of many experiments, and it starts out with satellite experiments, uh, say, of the area of one square meter. Uh, and then you can collect uh, fluxes which are very high, say, in the order of particles per square meter uh, and minute, something like that. Uh, then you also do balloon experiments, and with balloon experiments you can reach areas, uh, detection areas of five square meter, but still you are limited then in the flux which you can measure. And uh, it goes up here to an energy of about 10 to the 14 electron volts. Uh, then just there is not enough collection area uh, to measure sufficiently many of these particles to study their origin. And it's a true accident in nature that just where the flux here is so difficult to measure with direct experiments on top of the atmosphere, uh, the atmosphere is transparent enough so that you can start measuring uh, the particles at lower fluxes by earthbound experiments, namely by air shower experiments, which I will describe uh, later in a little bit more detail. Uh, so there is even overlap between the direct experiments and the air shower based, uh, um, uh, uh, air shower based uh, uh, experiments on Earth. So that's a lucky uh, feature, and so therefore we have a full understanding here of the flux spectrum uh, over this enormous dynamic range. So what do we want to measure? What do we want to understand uh, in cosmic ray physics? Well, this is a long question, a long-standing question. We still don't understand where these particles come from. And you may know that about one third of the, uh, of the, of the natural radiation that hits us uh, is by cosmic rays. Uh, and, and this, even we don't understand where these particles come from. So it's, it's an embarrassing situation for a scientist. You know? I mean, these particles are there everywhere, and we don't understand where they come from. We have some ideas, but we don't have a precise understanding. Uh, and then we want to understand what are these particles made of? Are these uh, protons, are these nuclei, or are these different particles? Again, we need to understand this. And then, uh, in the end, of course, we want to understand how the uh, cosmic ray accelerators work. We know how the LHG at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, works, uh, but we don't precisely understand how the cosmic accelerators work. And you will see they are much more powerful than the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, at least in, in maximum energy. Uh, and, and that is also the next question. I mean, we want to know, is this spectrum just continuing forever? I mean, can nature produce as high energies as you like? Or is there some end to the spectrum by some limiting uh, parameters in, in, in nature? So that we want to understand. Uh, and then also something which I will more or less be unable to address today is uh, we can use, actually, can, can make use of these enormous energies uh, to study fundamental law, fundamental laws in, in nature. For example, we can study uh, the uh, Lorentz invariance or violation, possible violation of Lorentz invariance. We can study smoothness of space-time structure much beyond accelerator-based experiments. And uh, well, this is also what you can do by just making use of the enormous energy which nature provides to us. So what we see here is the same spectrum that I showed before. The only difference is that in this case now, uh, the y-axis has been multiplied uh, with the energy to some power. And the reason for doing this is that you just emphasize structures, uh, the visibility of structures in the view graph. And uh, when you look at the same data as before, you see now very clearly there is a 
break here in the spectrum that we call the mean in the cosmic ray spectrum. And then there is some recovery feature here that we call the anchor of the cosmic ray spectrum. And then the flux drops down here. And this is mainly what I will talk about uh, today to understand uh, the origin of this flux suppression here in the higher frequency. We do have some ideas already uh, what the origin of these particles is. And uh, uh, what we think is uh, nowadays, and there is consensus about this at least, that the so-called me here at 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 electron volts, the me marks the end of the galactic cosmic ray accelerators, which we think are supernova remnants. Uh, and uh, so what happens then is that the protons, because of the maximum energy in any um, uh, electromagnetic acceleration process, the maximum energy depends on the uh, atomic number of the element. Uh, so then the protons break off first here, and then uh, heavier elements take over, and then in the end, ion, which is supposed to be the heaviest fragments which you find to a significant amount, and then the heaviest fragments break over here, ion, at 26 times the energy of the proton. Uh, and in fact, these features are observed now in, in experiments like Cascade, which was mentioned in the introduction. Uh, and that gives you a good uh, support to this picture that uh, the me actually marks the end of the galactic uh, cosmic rays. And then at the highest energies, we don't know really. Uh, one classical picture is that the so-called anchor is just caused by extragalactic cosmic rays entering the atmosphere and then taking over the flux. So they enter with about the same slopes as the galactic accelerator, but with uh, lower flux and they reach to higher energies. So they take over here and then they break off for whatever reason. However, another picture which you can imagine, which only came up the last few years, is in principle you may expect the, exactly the same feature here at the highest energies as you observe already at the lowest energies. That means that also the extragalactic accelerators, whatever the sources are, what the accelerators are, that the extragalactic accelerators can actually particles, say protons, to 10 to the 19 electron volts, and then uh, because of the limiting magnetic confinement in the accelerators, uh, only the um, elements with, with higher atomic number can be accelerated to higher energies. So you may see the same feature here at the highest energies that you observe already for the galactic accelerators at lower energies. So that's an open question. And uh, the question that is, uh, why do we think at all that the high energy particles are extra galactic origin? Uh, and that can be illustrated nicely in this graph. So this is supposed to be the Milky Way, it's the Andromeda galaxy as you recognize. Uh, and then what I've done here, we know about what the magnetic field strengths are in the galactic plane. Uh, it's about three microgauss typically. Uh, and then you can calculate, say, for a proton at 10 to the 20 electron volt, what the radius of curvature is, just the magnetic bending power. And you see, protons would move more or less on straight lines already at 10 to the 20 electron volts. That means if there were an accelerator in the galaxy, in, in our own galaxy, then the protons would reach us on straight lines. So we could, would see the source. And also, um, uh, the other formula is that the protons could not be confined anymore in the galaxy. Because, I mean, you cannot bend them around and, and refuse them and, and just keep them bound in the galaxy. So therefore, uh, surely, I mean, uh, even if there were accelerators, we could not confine the, the particles in the, uh, in the galaxy. It's somewhat uh, less problematic for heavier elements, and, but you see, even for iron nuclei, the radius of curvature at 10 to the 20 electron volts is more than the size of the galactic disk. So you could also not confine these heavy particles. Uh, so therefore, the conjecture is that just the product of the size times the magnetic field is too small in our own galaxy to either accelerate the particles or to confine the particles uh, in the galaxy. And therefore, we generally believe uh, that the origin is uh, of extragalactic uh, nature. This has a nice attractive uh, side aspect because it would allow you then in principle to do <coughs> astronomy uh, with these particles. Generally, you cannot do astronomy with cosmic, cosmic, cosmic rays because of their strong deviation or deflection in magnetic fields. However, at the highest energies, uh, the picture changes as illustrated here. So you may be able to start doing astronomy. However, astronomers would laugh at you because the uh, angular resolution will be still very poor. It will be on the order of some degrees, say, because of the still uh, a fair deflection in the magnetic field. 
So it's like doing astronomy for the bottom of a swimming pool, uh, looking at the sky, more or less like that. Uh, and I will come to this also. Uh, so this is uh, illustrated here. Uh, so typically, um, the, the lava radius in the galaxy, where that is the magnetic field of micro Gauss strength, is on the order of kiloparsec, as I've shown before. And for intergalactic uh, magnetic field, we have on the scale of nano Gauss strength. Uh, and then the radius of curvature becomes megaparsec. So it's, it's more or less uh, a straight line. And then it's a question, of course, of the coherence of the magnetic field or which extended area that is a coherent magnetic field. And then typically, you get deflections like here in the case. Uh, so this work then is to say uh, the deflections become weak enough to send to the 19 electron volt according to the present understanding of intergalactic and galactic uh, magnetic fields. So the question then is what could these accelerators be? Where would you find them in nature? And uh, a, a famous plot uh, is this one. It's a so-called Hillas plot uh, named after Hillas, uh, Michael Hillas from the UK. And what's plotted is very simple. You plot just the magnetic field strengths of various astronomical objects as a function of their extension. And then uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, rate, or what you need then is, the, is a product which is sufficiently large in these two quantities. That means if, for example, you want to have protons from a putative accelerators of 10 to the 20 electron volts, then you need to find sources which are at least at the red line here or better in this area. So all the accelerators in this area are not powerful enough to accelerate particles to 10 to the 20 electron volt. So take, for example, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, which just starts operation these days, again, with six and a half TeV protons. Uh, it's far below uh, the energy what we need. And of course, it's no astronomical object. Uh, and uh, the situation gets a bit more relaxed for heavier nuclei like ions because of this 20 factor of 26 in atomic number. Uh, and then you get close to some object like active galactic nuclei, which are driven by powerful uh, mass, uh, massive uh, black holes, uh, or also by the jets of radio galaxies. Uh, and here are some illustrations uh, of this. So these are our potential candidates, uh, jets of radio galaxy, active galactic nuclei, or also possibly uh, gamma ray bursts. Uh, possible sources. And uh, so here are just uh, some um, uh, pictures from uh, astronomical pictures from various objects. Uh, on the left hand side, you see uh, a supernova remnant uh, taken here in, uh, in, in radio observations. And uh, there we believe, because of the product of a magnetic field times uh, diameter of the uh, acceleration region here, you may accelerate particles to 10 to the 16 electron volt. And then in objects like this, for example, Cygnus A, where the actual host galaxy is that point here, uh, that is where the galaxy is and where the massive black hole uh, uh, sits. Uh, and then there are these jets uh, in, in this direction. You see the extension of the jets relative to the size of the galaxy. Uh, and then this is what we call the lobes, the radio lobes. And there is enormous energy which pops up, which pops up here uh, and, and that, that forms a hot plasma, dense plasma. And uh, with shock waves here, the termination shocks, for example, and there the belief is that you may possibly reach out to 10 to the 20 electron volt. But nobody has proven it yet. Uh, and that's just another example. And then the problem is, as you will see, that these objects in general are, are very far away. I mean, on cos cosmological scale, they are very nearby. However, on, on our scale, they are far away with 200 megaparsecs. And that will be a problem that I will discuss in a bit. So, just to illustrate to you again what it means to accelerate particles of 10 to the 20 electron volts, uh, this is a picture I showed before, and, and LHC just starts operation with six and a half TeV protons these days. And then a very simple question is to ask, okay, I mean, if I take this most powerful technique uh, that we have at hand with LHC, uh, and we want to go to the next generation of, of collider, uh, how much do we have to enlarge the Large Hadron Collider uh, in order to be able uh, to X-ray protons to 10 to the 20 electron volts uh, to do physics there? Uh, and assuming that you cannot increase the strength of the magnetic fields, and that's already very challenging with the superconducting magnetic fields used at LHC, uh, the only question is, uh, the only possibility is to enlarge the radius of the diameter. 
And when you do the calculation going in this direction, you finally end up <laughs> with an accelerator which compares to the Earth orbit around the Sun. And, and that's the accelerator we are looking for, right? Uh, and still with a, with a uh, several Tesla strong magnetic field. So the joke which I make then, so vacuum is already there, so I mean, that's a super magnetic field, uh, and then we do the acceleration of particles. But this gives you an impression of what we are looking for. I mean, objects of this scale, I mean, it may be solar system size, and, and interestingly, if you calculate the, the Schwarzschild radius for massive black holes of a billion solar masses, you end up uh, on this scale, actually. So this is another independent indication that this may be in fact uh, related to the acceleration of cosmic rays. So this gives you an impression, so these accelerators exist in the universe, and they have to be nearby. And uh, um, why do they have to, near, to be nearby? That I will discuss uh, very soon. So let me just first show uh, the first observation of uh, a 10 to the 20 electron volt cosmic ray particle. This was already 1962 by John Lindsay. You see him here in New Mexico, where he operated a small array of particle detectors. And you see um, uh, just uh, some, um, uh, some haystack, which is on top of his scintillation detector. And, and you may wonder what he is doing here. So he just is poking for rattlesnakes before he does service <laughs> uh, to the uh, to this detector, and you see how dangerous our field, our field is. <laughs> uh, and he was extremely lucky, however, that even with his small telescope, after two years of, uh, with his small um, uh, uh, air shower experiment, after two years of operation, he, he observed a particle of this energy. Uh, and, uh, and, and you can verify his calibration, uh, which he did uh, with modern computers, and you find he did a very good job, I mean, just I mean, by easy calculation. So it was impressive amount of work, and it was basically done by his own. I mean, the entire experiment, unbelievable. Uh, uh, so yeah, he was a very special person. And uh, so this is just um, a computer animation to demonstrate to you what an air shower is. So the particle came from here, entered the atmosphere, and then you see you get more and more particles, and they form this kind of shower front, this curved shower front. Then you have particle detectors on ground, and then they get hit by the particles here. And you see. They have just a sequence, a time sequence of when the particles at ground are hit by the air shower. And the time sequence here tells you about the direction of the particle, just by triangulation. So the timing here tells you the direction of the initial particle. And the total number of particles that you observe here at ground, then, just by the samples which you take here and there and there, the total number tells you something about the total energy of the particle that it had when it entered the atmosphere. So this is basically how you reconstruct these uh, air showers. In, in detail, of course, it's a bit more complicated, but this is the basic uh, input uh, to, the, to the calculation. And so this was a case in, in John Lindsay. Uh, so here you see his small array, uh, just a few square kilometer, and the shower just hit the edge of his array, and then he did this kind of the circle that indicate the, the, the lines of equal particle density, uh, and then he constructed from that the energy, which was then uh, what is given in the particle, which is shared in the time. So that was the first observation of the particle, and then really uh, people were excited and asked questions, I mean, uh, does it go on forever? I mean, always higher energies. And then this was 62, and then you may remember uh, some of us that in 65, uh, the CMB was discovered by Penzias and Wilson. Uh, and uh, so this was artificial or uh, accidental uh, the discovery. Uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation, so they were earned the Nobel Prize for this. And, and why does this uh, relate to cosmic rays? And, and I'm really impressed that only two months after the discovery of the CMB, on the one side, and the cosmic rays were found in uh, 1962 already, two months after the discovery, there were two papers appearing uh, understanding there is a connection between the CMB and the cosmic rays. And, and I find it really impressive. And what is the connection? Uh, there were these two papers in the US by Kenneth Bryson. It says end of the cosmic ray uh, spectrum question mark. And then in Russia, uh, Sarchepin and Kuspin, uh, they wrote upper limit to the spectrum of cosmic rays. So why is that? Um, they were buried by this event, which found, was found by Lindsay in 62. <coughs> that actually, that should not have been observed uh, because uh, particles of this energy experience of interaction with the microwave background radiation, uh, which I show on the next slide. And at that time, the temperature of the microwave background <coughs> radiation was not known yet. It could have been 2 Kelvin or could have been, say, 10 Kelvin. 
Uh, and then he did this calculation here for different temperatures of the CFD, and then calculated that the spectrum should drop off below energies which are observed uh, by this one event. And uh, this slide here uh, shows what happens uh, in the CFD. So take a proton of say 10 to the 20 electron volts that, in, that, that propagates through the microwave background radiation. We know precisely what the photon density is. It's 412 photons in each cubic centimeter of the universe. We just know for Boltzmann, Stefan Boltzmann law and the temperature. Uh, and then uh, the proton interacts with the CMD and then it produces a delta resonance which was known already by that time for the Schrader experiment. And then the delta is, a very, is a, just an excited state of the proton. And then the delta decays within 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 21 uh, seconds uh, to a proton and pi zero. And in this process, then the proton has lost about 30% of its initial energy. And then it's clear the process can repeat. If that proton is still above the threshold, then it can undergo again that kind of interaction. Uh, and when you calculate the threshold energy for this process to take place, uh, you just take the four momentum uh, of the delta resonance, which was known as a proton, and then you find that the threshold energy for this process is six times 10 to the 19 electron volts, for below the energy that Linse observed in this event. Uh, and you can also calculate what the mean free pass of the proton that is in the CMD, uh, and that is simply uh, given uh, by the um, by the cross section of the delta resonance, which we know, and uh, by the photon density, which we know as well. And then you find that the mean free pass is a few megaparsec, which means uh, that after several interactions, basically the process <laughs> is below the threshold, and then the process doesn't occur anymore. Uh, and, and that's why we speak about, uh, say, the G that K horizon, uh, which is the volume from which you can observe particles in excess of 10 to the 12 or in excess of 6 times 10 to the 90 electron volts. And that's about 60 megaparsecs, which is a nearby universe. So the sources that we observe and produce particles of uh, more than 6 times 10 to the 90 electron volts have to be very nearby these powerful sources. And that makes it so interesting. And there cannot be so many sources producing this enormous amount of energy. Another interesting uh, feature of nature is that uh, you may ask in the question, okay, what happens if, if not a proton propagates through the CMD, but the nucleus? So the X-ray that may also uh, X-ray uh, nuclei. Uh, and uh, then what happens there is uh, something which is, again, was known already at that time from nuclear physics, which is uh, called for the disintegration. So what's that? Uh, the, the nucleus interacts with the CMD, and then the, just the, the nucleus uh, disintegrates protons and neutrons. And by that, I mean the nucleus completely disintegrates after a very short distance already. So therefore, also nuclei don't survive in the CMD at these energies. So you cannot observe, uh, say, ion nuclei from distant sources. And the threshold, interestingly, is, is about the same, very much the same, which is just accidental nature. In this case, it's uh, giant resonances which are uh, responsible and here it's a uh, and, and this is just the calculation of what the uh, energy loss length is, and you see the process that's in very sharply at six times the ninety electron volts. So that's called the GZK effect and the GZK suppression. And uh, so this was known already. And if you then look in the nearby universe, so we are located here. Uh, these are galaxy clusters, Centaurus cluster, Virgo cluster, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you see there are not so many galaxy clusters and powerful sources around. And in fact, as I said before, you should be able to do uh, limited astronomy at these energies. So if there are sources somewhere here uh, in, in these objects, uh, you should be able to identify the sources. So the, at least the arrival directions of the particles should be highly unassociated. They should not come from any direction equally. Uh, because you limit your volume. So that's important to, uh, to realize. Okay. Uh, so what was the situation then, uh, say, uh, eight years ago before we started to take data with the, with the OJ Observatory? Uh, the question was, I mean, there were experiments in Japan, Agasa, actually Agasa uh, didn't observe any suppression, and these are the old data, uh, old data of Agasa. Uh, and, and then there was the high-risk experiment in US, they, mm, they were not sure that they indicated some suppression, so the question was really unsettled at that time. And, uh, Again, it's interesting that actually the Agasa experiment motivated a number of theoretical models and also motivated uh, to a large extent the construction of an even larger observatory than Agasa and Hyrule were, just to settle that question. Uh, and so